Hello, I'm Rit Udison, Executive and Artistic Director at the Loft Literary Center. Welcome to this live stream at Virtual Wordplay. I'm so glad you're here with us. Before we get started, I want to talk a little bit about what brought us here today. For the last year, the Loft staff has been working hard to put together an outdoor book festival that would have gathered 100 authors with 10,000 visitors in our neighborhood in downtown Minneapolis. As COVID-19 hit, we knew we had to think about everything we do differently, especially this festival. While we were disappointed that we wouldn't be able to gather in person, we became even more committed to supporting writers, celebrating new books, and finding new ways to assert the connective power of the written word. In a time of anxiety, we want to offer a powerful event for readers, writers, and booksellers. When we first approached our sponsors, their first question was, what is a virtual festival? And to be honest, we didn't know. Our founding partners, St. Catherine University and Star Tribune, agreed to make a leap of faith with The Loft. With courage, generosity, and vision, they have worked alongside us to figure out what this virtual festival might become. We are grateful to our sponsors and donors. Their generosity is incredible, but it is not enough. We believe it is essential, especially during a health and financial crisis, to offer programs that are free and accessible to all. But that has led to a significant revenue loss. A live event would have included ticket revenue, beer sales, exhibitor fees, and additional sponsorships. The Loft is not closed. We continue to offer classes, fellowships, conversations, support for readers and writers in addition to this festival. We are here to support the literary community and we ask that you continue to support us. If you are able, please consider making a contribution to the law today. Thank you for being here. Hi everyone, and welcome to the Lost Word Plays Rage on the Page with Lauren Van uh, Laura Vandenberg and Amber Sparks. I'm Abby Frank Taylor and I work here at The Loft. Uh, before we get started, we want to thank Wordplay's presenting sponsors, St. Catherine University and Star Tribune for making this virtual festival happen. Um, if you'd like to support Lost programming like this, um, you can do so by clicking the support button below. Um, and also at that button, you can pre-order a copy of Laura's book, I Hold a Wolf by the Ears, and order Amber's book, and I Do Not Forgive You, um, from our friends at Majors and Quinn. Uh, an easy way to not only support our local bookshops and these amazing authors, but also to have some great books to keep you company while we're sheltering in place. Um, and with that, I'd love to turn it over to Lauren Amber. Thanks so much for being here. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you Abby. Hi, Amber. So good Hi, to Lauren. see you. It's good to see you too. Yeah. <laughs> Virtually or no. Virtually or no. I'll take it. <laughs> um, I think so. We had talked about... Um, doing uh reading a little bit before we get into the conversation yeah yes yes yeah. would you like to would you like to kick it off um i can yes awesome all right all right <laughs> um so yeah thanks to loft and wordplay um i'm excited to be doing this with amber and i i can't see you anyone who's <laughs> watching or listening but whoever you are wherever you are um Thank you for coming to hang out uh, virtually and uh, hope, hope you're staying safe. I'm going to read a, the opening of a story from um, I Hold a Wolf by the Ears. The um, story is called Your Second Wife and it's written in short sections. It's about a woman who has a number of jobs, one of which is impersonating dead wives for bereaved husbands. Um, and I'm gonna read the first couple of sections. So here's a bit of Your Second Wife gig economy. The photograph arrives in a padded manila envelope pressed between two sheets of cardboard. The picture is a headshot with a blue nothing background of a corporate portrait. The dead wife wears a starched white blouse and a black jacket. Gray irises like slivers of ice, a modest toothless smile, tasteful gold studs in her earlobes. Her name is, was, Beth Butler, and she was killed in a hiking accident five weeks ago. As a grief freelancer, this is not the first time I have received such a photo, nor is it the first time the photo has been mailed with such care. 
the husbands. I have yet to be hired by a wife. Contact me at a designated email. I send them an online questionnaire and request a photograph to be mailed to a PO box because I like to be able to hold the wives in my hands. And as my sister has pointed out many times before, I can't be giving these grieving husbands my home address. Next, I require three videos of the wives in their natural environments, delivering a work presentation or jogging along a river or carrying a birthday cake into a crowded singing room. Then I need a week to prepare and then we meet. Between impersonating dead wives, I work as a part-time dog walker and a part-time landscaper and a part-time food delivery courier. What an unbelievably exhausting moment to be alive in this era of the gig economy. The overcoat. I never meant to get into this line of work, though I cannot deny that I've always enjoyed being other people. In college, I interviewed to be a wealthy woman's personal assistant. Over lunch, she asked me if I knew the difference between torturous and torturous, between adverse and averse. Once it was apparent that I did not, she told me that the ability to make these fine distinctions was a critical skill in a personal assistant and that I should not bother ordering dessert. It was late fall, and the wealthy woman arrived wearing a magnificent fur coat, quarter length, and dyed lavender. When the woman went to the bathroom, she left her coat slung over the back of her chair, and I walked out with it. I wore the lavender fur all through the winter and was transformed from a student who slept in the backs of lecture halls to one who made the dean's list. Every time I took a test, I imagined being a young woman of great means, of waking each morning to find my future rolled out before me, free of obstacle and horizon. Old pal. I discovered my gift for impersonating dead wives quite by accident. It was a year after college and I dreamed of attending architecture school because I wanted to build skyscrapers. Then my best friend's wife died of a brain aneurysm, and he did not leave his bed for a month. I was working part-time for a theater makeup artist, and I brought in a photo of my best friend's dead wife and asked for her help. Three hours later, I turned up at his door in a frosted blonde wig and tinted contacts and a prosthetic chin. I had even broken into his garage and gotten some of her clothes out of storage, a linen dress, strappy sandals, a black crossbody purse. Let's get going, I said when he answered the door. His clothes were rumpled, his breath rank, he was barefoot, and his toenails had grown into small talons. Or we'll miss the movie. We strolled arm in arm to the theater, as I knew he and his wife used to do every Sunday. After the matinee, we had a drink on the patio of a nearby restaurant, as was their custom, and I ordered her drink, an old pal, even though I can't stand rye whiskey and so considered this flourish to be nothing less than an act of love. Forget about skyscrapers, my best friend said as I walked him home. This right here is your calling. Later, he told his grieving colleague about what I had done, and then that colleague told a neighbor, and then I had word of mouth, and then I had cards for a business called Your Second Wife. More photographs of dead wives came in the mail, and suddenly I had four part-time jobs instead of three and was too busy to apply to architecture school. On the city streets, I would gaze up at skyscrapers and wonder what had ever happened to the person who had wanted to build such great and terrible things. And I'll stop there. That was great. Um, <laughs> what an unbelievably exhausting time to be alive. <laughs> That's a great line. And it uh, <laughs> feels very apt right about now. Um, exhausting in a different way. So I'm just going to read, uh, this is a really short piece um, called You Won't Believe What Really Happened to the Saved by Women. Uh, so, um, and I, yeah, I'm actually going to read the whole thing because it's very short. After the attack, we pulled ourselves shut like hospital curtains. Snap. They out there, we in here, pain distilled through tiny wires and tubes. Pain concealed and compressed until somebody has great need of it until it becomes a gift. History will tell you we made quick peace with our rapists, bore them children, married them. History will tell you how we launched ourselves into the battle like burning arrows, how we landed between kin and assaulters. History will tell you we united Rome. History likes to lie about women. 
What really happened was this. When we saw our men at war, we almost went out like candles. It's easy to shrink yourself down when anger burns through you, hot, fierce, like a grass fire. It sucks the oxygen out. It eats up all but the most essential parts, heart, lungs, brain, blood. Everything else diminishes, shadows itself, chases out disease. To shrink after anger is such a relief. To run toward oblivion, a slaking of dark thirst. And Demeter saw us scrambling in her fields like mice and took pity on us. For had she not been assaulted by Poseidon, forced despite all her powers to bear his twins, she knew what it is to carry the weight of so much rage. And so she pulled us into her arms, up with the soil, up with the grass, and she scattered us through the skies as stars shimmering and immortal in the night. And for thousands of years, when men looked at the skies, our husbands, our sons, our grandsons, and so on for many generations, they saw us and were filled with remorse and they remembered what it is to be a woman at the mercy of men. They built us a temple with statues of ivory and gold. And every seven years, the daughters of Rome wove new dresses for us for the finest cloth on earth. Now we are forgotten. We faded in the sky and no men remember us. They tell our stories the way they never happened. And though the women can sense that something is wrong, the feeling is too vague for resolution. The halo of lights from the city and the haze from the cars keep us almost hidden from human view. We are growing jaded, sadder. We can only speak in whispers now, but we still remember our power what our whispers can warn of if we aim them at the right ears. Our choice is coming to a head. Finally unleash our vengeance or forget that we were ever here. We cannot destroy man alone. We lost the ability to do that ages ago. We are only so much stardust and only a little earth still anchors us at all. But it is that little bit that keeps us interested keeps us watching over the women of this world, waiting, hoping for the ones who will say our names. They have only to summon us. They have only to say that they've needed us so. And we would swoop down then like hawks, our pain finally put to use, propelling us to the foot of the earth. We would eat evil men like mice. We would rebuild the world in our image, in our glory, in our dazzling beauty and brilliance. And then, only then, would we do the thing they say we did long ago, rid them of their wars and bring them peace beyond dreaming, beyond the imagining of any living thing. That was amazing. Um, all right, where should we begin? Um, give so me one second. Yes, let's talk. Well, give me one second, everyone. Um, I'm, I'm having a weird power issue with my computer. <laughs> so hold on one second and I'm gonna go see if I can power into a different table. Yes. This happened to me the first time I did a virtual event um, where I realized like halfway through that my, I did not have enough charge to make it to the end and I was not anywhere near a charger. <laughs> And then just ended up kind of like wandering around with my laptop trying to and I could like <laughs> find my charger and just sort of like don't don't mind me. I'm just yeah, going for, <laughs> going for a stroll. Oh my gosh. So I so I, I found it, victory. Um I had the wrong charger plugged in. So that's that's the problem right around my house right now. Like I think we have I see like six computers. I'm not even kidding. Like just all plugged into different places. Yeah, right well, now. no, that's it makes so much sense. Like that's where we live now in in in, in the in the machines. It is crazy. I know. Like my husband and I are both working from home. Like everyone and, and like yeah. so many people. And then I've got like writing computers and other. It's just it's a mess. Anyway, <laughs> speaking of which, um, uh, the place where we live now, um. Yeah, so so I know before um, before this, Laura and I were talking a little bit, um, uh, and I know that we wanted to talk a little bit about rage, uh, since that is the topic of the conversation, um, and and that's actually why I read the piece that I did. Um, obviously, there's a lot of rage in that piece, um, uh, and um, so I wonder if we want to talk about sort of. We, have, we were having some interesting conversations offline about um, 
rage and the different ways it sort of manifests itself in our in our writing. Um, you know, for instance, I think uh, in a lot of your pieces um, that I read in this new collection, and also, you know, obviously some of your other work, um, it's it's a more it's not sort of your typical, you know, bust out of the page rage. Um, it's a little bit more muted. I think mm -hmm. little, so it, talk, talk a little, let's talk a little bit about that if you, if you don't mind. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think like, I spent a lot of time with these stories because I do think that they have rage in them, but, it, but as you're saying, it's not necessarily like, yeah. Um, <laughs> if somebody jumps rage. out with an ax. Um, it's, 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 it, 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 it's, it's sort of a, it's more of a subterranean thing. And I, I thought a lot, of, I actually spent a lot of time thinking about like, what is the difference between anger and rage? Um, and for me, anger is more of maybe like an immediate emotional state. And it's particularly, and it's directed at like a specific thing. Like I'm angry at my boss. I'm angry at my partner. I'm, like angry at my senator, et cetera. And when I think of rage, I think of it, um, at least in the context of these stories, of an emotional state that in, in some ways is so sort of overwhelming and unfathomable that it has to find a different expression. Like it can't kind of live in the body. It has to sort of go somewhere else. And, um, and I was really interested in that idea um, of like how a character's rage, which I think for these characters is is sort of like it's like sharply felt, but not necessarily clearly named uh, at the at the same time. And um, thinking about like that idea of how does rage actually transform their internal weather, and in some cases the sort of external world that they're moving through as well. Um, I also, another thing that I thought about a lot in the in the context of these stories is sort of like, what is the character angry about and what is the story angry about? Um, there's like, there's one story um, that where a husband and wife are having a conversation that it is like, it's he's not named, but it's like pretty clearly um, they're talking about the Kavanaugh hearings and the wife is like full of rage about the, the 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 certainty of Kavanaugh's confirmation despite everything that we know. Um, and I think like the story is angry about that too, but the story is also angry at the questions that that character isn't asking. Like, how did we get here? What are you as an individual willing to give up in order to make to, to make a world where a person like Kavanaugh um, isn't possible, or it's not possible for at least for him to be confirmed as a Supreme Court justice. Um, and so I think that, that the way that the stories could access sort of dimensions of rage, the characters like aren't necessarily, they haven't yet um, accrued the insight to recognize those, those dimensions. Yeah, that's, that's so funny that you, that you mentioned that piece. Um, uh, Cause that's the, so the piece that I just read is actually a piece that I wrote after the night that Kavanaugh was confirmed. Um, and that was, that was the reason I wrote the piece. It was, um, and it's, and it's interesting because it's exactly what you say. It was sort of a, it, it's much more of a me, <laughs> the, me, the narrator, uh, me, the, me, the world creator being angry uh, than it is any, you know, obviously the characters in the story, the story um, you know, uh, we uh, have their own set of rage, but it's, you know, about this specific issue about Rome and uh, sort of, you know, it, it's almost like I was like, okay, in order to be in this place where I can be so angry about this and yet do something productive with it, it has to, I have to set this thing way, way back, <laughs> like, like mm -hmm. as far removed as possible. And something that's still, you know, obviously very related, um, it, you know, the same issue, essentially, the timeless assault on women. But, um, but yeah, definitely a, a very different kind of anger um, in a weird way. Yeah. Um, I, but yeah, that's, yeah, I think that's right. Think yeah. Also, oh, oh go sorry. Go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry. My dog. My dog. My no, dog you're fine. Um, I was actually going to warn people about my cats, so they yes. didn't just pop up. Um, yes, same. For, forewarned of a, a barking, a barking dog who might <laughs> like burst, burst in and make an appearance. Um, I was curious, like one thing that we had talked about, I mean, this has already come up a little bit, but um, thinking about, you know, working on um, 
Oh, I would be curious with your collection, which has a lot of stories. I think it's like they're 22. Is that, is that right? Something um, like that. Yeah. Yeah. And I was curious, like what sort of period of time were they written over? Like, like what, like what's the oldest and what's the newest? And then maybe like an adjacent question, operating under the assumption that you were writing some of these stories like pretty close to our now, um, since the, the book is just just out earlier this year. Like, did you feel like you were approaching the subject of, of rage differently um, than you were in past in past work? Yeah, yes, absolutely. And, and it's interesting because I actually, the, the book was sort of, you know, it started out, I was just writing all these pieces um, that I was like, calling my revenges um and I was actually writing a novel <laughs> and still yeah. am writing a novel and so you know as a short story writer I was like you know I have to I'm just trying to keep myself <laughs> occupied while writing the novel um and uh and you know I I, I was just writing these things because I was you know ever since like I guess 2016 for obvious reasons I was just more and, and more pissed um and specifically thinking about women and thinking about me too and thinking about all these things and um and at some point I remember mentioning to somebody to a friend of mine that I was writing these and they were like you should put them into a book and I was like oh would that be interesting to anyone else and they were like yes yeah. <laughs> catharsis would be good for lots of people right now I was like oh okay um and I did but it but but it was interesting because obviously and and you can probably can tell if you if you read the book which stories are sort of the more immediate rage pieces as opposed to sort of the the other pieces which um you know are a little bit older some of them from you know 2000 you know 15 16 17 uh, or 16 i guess um that you know still have that same sort of quality um and, and are still very much in the mindset of, a, of thinking about women. They're all stories told by women. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, same for me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but but definitely have like a little bit, I think, of a, a less immediate sense of, of, of grievance. Um, you know, more of the like, um, you know, we, we, I remember we were talking about, um, I know we both love Joy Williams. And I, I think a lot about um, her, you know, this 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 sort of like I don't know passivity of her characters. This it's it's almost like a um it, it there's almost this rage in the passivity of the characters. This like abs like so much emotion and so much um so much uh, sort of world understanding that they're like unable to do anything. And I think that is what some of the older stories mm -hmm. have. That's that's and maybe some of the newer stories. Uh, actually, you know, I was like, okay, you know what, all those characters that I had before that, like, were unable to do anything except sort of just, like, roll through the world, like, being paralyzed by their, um, by their, uh, their own sort of boiling feelings, now they're gonna get to take some revenge. <laughs> now they get to get the axe out, or the poison. Yeah. Yeah, I, I found myself thinking a lot more about, like, systems um in thinking about like how I was sort of a approaching rage in my writing in the last couple of years instead of I think in some of my older work I mean there are plenty of angry women but um but it was maybe like the representation was like a little bit more hermetic or this little uh, sort of more of looking at it in, 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 in a kind of individual context and I, yeah thinking a lot more about systems and um, how the systems that these women have been moving through have been doing harm to them, but also how they're sort of culpable in terms of their own participation, um, and that and that and that sort of terrible cycle. Um, so yeah, thinking about it in a more systemic context um, for sure. Yeah, I think that's right. It's it's um, it, it's sort of I don't I don't know that I would say so. So there's something weird about transformation almost. Um, in, a, in the sense that um, I was thinking a lot about, about rage and how um, anger can, how you can still disappear or still mm -hmm. go away or transform yeah. without, without that being like some sort of defeat or lessening of power. And that sometimes that's actually like, you know, if w women are being abused, right? If there's, if there's situations where women need to like leave, disappear, um, that that's, that that's, not an always an escape that sometimes or if it is an escape sometimes it's, it's survival um and it's actually like 
um, the, the most positive outcome. Um, and, and how there's like this weird sense of power in, um, in you know, transforming or in disappearing acts. Um, you know, the sort of, I think about the first story in your new collection and, and there's sort of, is sort of, you know, um, is all about what, you know, the, the first sentence, uh, sorry to read your work, but I wanna tell you about the night I got hit by a train and died. The thing is it never happened. And then there's sort of this whole thing of, of, of how, you know, the narrator could have disappeared and all the ways that that, all the sort of ways that that could have happened, but didn't, um, which is really, I think is um, a really interesting idea, sort of playing with this idea that there's not, there's not sort of one way of like, um, you know, I'm, I'm angry, now I'm going to pick up a gun, and that's, and this is the thing that happens, and it goes off at the end of the story, but rather mm -hmm. that there's like all this power and all these other sort of ways of, of, um, of, of transforming and of being and disappearing. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think maybe sometimes there's the expectation that rage will lead to to a, a confrontation in the in the in the in the sort of literal sense. But I mean, I think I'm I'm the most interested in work where yeah, rage is transmuted in some way. It's transformed. Um, it's it it. Um, it, it, it takes on a sort of more unexpected manifestation. And that actually leads me to a question um, about your work, Amber. Like, I, I feel like, I mean, you're very drawn to what we might just broadly call non-realist worlds. I mean, you have ghosts in your stories, you have worlds that are speculative, futuristic, um, dystopian, um, and, and I, I mean, this is something I also thought a lot with I, I Hold a Wolf. I mean, some of the stories are, are more in a um, realist vein, others not at all. Right. Um, but thinking about sort of, in my case, in the engagement with the ghost story and writing into the supernatural and like, what is that kind of a conduit to in terms of the emotional lives of the characters that can't really be accessed through other channels? And I, yeah, I was curious to see like, what do you feel like when you're when you're writing these non-realist worlds? Like, what do they give you access to in terms of emotion, rage, experience, all of that that you feel like um, you you can't really get through the realist story? Yeah, um, I think you know, I think it's a lot of different things, right? It's in some in some ways, it's just an expansion of of the possible of what is possible, which which sort of then also expands, um, I think, sort of the emotional scope of, of what a story can be for me. Um, and and, you know, at the same time, though, there's there's this sense there's something that I that I really love to play with. Um, where, you know, ghosts or you know, miraculous happenings, things like that. I, I actually I actually don't necessarily love stories where or or I'm maybe tired of stories where the, the miraculous is miraculous. And um and and I think it's really interesting to sort of look at things like that at, at ghosts, demons, you know, which is whatever and um and magic and and look at those in, in this really like banal way. Um, I, there's something about that to me that, um, I don't know, it, you know, <laughs> some people who probably hate my work would say it like, I successfully suck out the, you know, wonder from everything. Um, but in a way, it's, <laughs> which no. is probably true. I love doing that. <laughs> yeah. um, but but in a way, it's, it's sort of, I don't know, it gives, it, I feel like it gives, it opens up the idea of what, um, of, of like, I guess what is possible in everyday life, if that makes sense. That if there are all these ghosts and, um, you know, these magic is sort of this thing and, and people can just disappear and reappear, then perhaps that's not where you access miracle or, or where you access um, some sort of transcendence, that it actually comes from a really small moment in a human relationship or, mm -hmm. you know, that's why I could never, you know, and I, and I love this about your stories too, that your, you know, your, your stuff is still, it, it, it's always, there are always recognizable elements of a real world. Um, and, and I like that because, um, you know, uh, there, there, then there's a sense that there's something at stake and that maybe the thing that is most at stake is the thing that can be found in in everyday life mm -hmm. 
that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, it totally does. I mean, one thing that I was thinking about just as you were talking and thinking, going, going back to that sort of early thought about like, what's the difference between anger and rage is that um, like rage is, I mean, to me, it's, it's, a, it's a much more textured sort of emotional experience, um, right? Like, it's, it, anger is a component, but also I feel like rage can be, as we've been saying, transformative. Rage can be ecstatic. Um, rage can be exhilarating. Rage can be empowering. Rage can be destructive. Um, and... And I think that that, yeah, I, I wonder if there's something about that just sort of state of consciousness that lends itself to like a more multifaceted representation of, of reality where we're in futuristic worlds or magical worlds um, of fairy tales too. I mean, like I think of yeah. someone like Angela Carter, like fairy tales are real angry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> right? um, and violent. Yeah. And violent. Yes. Yes. A lot of like direct, confrontation yes. and manifestations of rage and fairy tales for sure but it's interesting <laughs> to think about like there's this kind of like like um great sort of texture to rage as a state of being this really powerful texture to raise this uh, uh, rage as a state of being that um it, it's it can be sort of like transformed in into yeah into like any kind of world you you want it to be in yeah no i think that's right and i think what, what you said is um you know it, it's so multifaceted and it and it it almost has this like mystic quality right like they're like you know you think about a lot of the sort of the female mystics um mm -hmm. and which has always been really fascinating to me and like and and so much of that is is sort of this you know pro this prophetic uh vision oh. which is often really rage filled right and a lot a lot of times these women became mystics because they had you know yeah. <laughs> terrible, horrible, yeah. violent experience. And like, and no one will listen to me. But I <laughs> right. Listen. So there, yeah. there, there's this like ecstasy, and there's also this like anger and and rage and and all of this this all of this complicated stuff. Um, mm -hmm. and it does lend this sort of it sort of opens up the the world view. Um, and and that's that's actually true of a lot of um a lot of my favorite women writers, you mentioned Angela Carter and, um, you know, Kelly Link does that really well and, and um, Carmen Maria Machado and, and, and um, there's a lot of other folks, um, Leonora Carrington, there's just there, yeah. there's women that sort of, it's like when they, they allow this anger in and, and allow it to boil, it sort of opens up this vision, visionary yeah. world. For sure. sure. Yeah. And I think for me, the presence of like a ghost in a story, it's like, it is, it's kind of opening um, a trap door in terms of the story's sense of reality, but also in kind of the character's self and consciousness um, and, 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 and giving them, it's, it's like a portal to a dimension that they couldn't, they couldn't get to on, yeah, on their own. And I think from the, um, your second wife, the story that I read, the opening of, it's like, that's a character who in some ways, I and mean, I think there's a lot of submerged rage, but it's, 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 it's not until, um, I mean, she's kind of like ghosting herself, um, through this life where she's constantly impersonating other people as a way to make money. Um, but it's like, she, I, I think in, in some ways that sort of story's engagement with hauntedness, like opens up this portal where she can, she can feel the anger um, that has been in some ways just kind of tranquilized by the the day-to-day -day mechanics of her life. And that's another thing too, I think is really interesting about rage, right? I mean, thinking about like transformation, disruption, and it's like, like, like rage does kind of stop you, you know what I mean? Like both in yeah. life and both it, a story. It's like you, it's, it's harder to, like you can be, I don't know, like peeved and, live your daily life um yeah. and just maybe be like a bit ill-tempered but if you are really in a state of rage like it's actually very hard to go through the motions of day-to-day -day life um and that that character ends up in a situation that's so extreme um that the rage does sort of stop her and it kind of like necessarily dismantles the way that she's been living so she can see it with a kind of clarity that wasn't available to her before yeah, I think that's right. Um, so I'm I'm actually curious then, since you're talking about it, how how you ordered your your collection or how you sort of 
decided to collect these stories and put them together? Yeah. Um, well, I had, and now I'm thinking, actually, sorry, and I, I'm not dodging. I promise I'm not dodging. <laughs> How many stories, you ended up with 22. How many stories did you start with or revenges did you start with? Um, did you have like a lot more? No. So, well, so, no. So I probably had like, 10 maybe something like that and, and then and then from that point once I decided that was a book then I started sort of collecting some of the other pieces that I had been writing over the years gotcha. that I thought was okay. it and then also I wrote like I think three or four more stories yeah, yeah. so you you were writing in the direction of the project I was, yeah, I was definitely, definitely yeah. Yeah. so I I felt like I wanted to write a story collection and I had a lot of stories um, I had maybe like, for me, I had a lot of stories. I had like 17 or 18, and that was way too many for a collection because some of them are, are, are long, right. um, but it would have been like, like 600 pages of short stories. <laughs> I, I love short I would stories read, but... <laughs> as much as like anyone, but I was like, no, nobody wants that. Um, so I, I think for me, the, yeah, I mean, that was a question I was walking around with probably like for a couple of years even where it's like, what is the book? You know, yeah. and I, I feel like for me, the story collections that I love and that are heart held, it's not just a random gathering of stories, but like in your, and I think your book does this so beautifully, like it really is, it's a portal into a world with a kind of unified sensibility and logic um, and, and a set of like thematic concerns that different stories are coming out from different vantages, et cetera. And so, I mean, there were some ways in which the stories are kind of like broadly related, but I, I really had to like look at it for a while before I could see, before I could kind of pull the book out of that heap. And then I was in a residency in 2018 and I wrote a lot of, I like um, three or four of the stories that ended up in the collection like pretty quickly. Um, and, and they all had sort of speculative supernatural element in, in different ways. And sort of once I added those stories to the heap, like on the one hand, I was just making the heap bigger, but it also was really clarifying because I was like, okay, here's the book. The book is these kind of sideways ghost stories, um, in, in which case, like, sometimes it's like a literal ghost, other times it's, it's, a, it's a more oblique um, manifestation of the ghost story. And I was able to sort of pull out the stories that were having that conversation. Um, and yeah, it was, um, I actually didn't do in terms of the individual stories, the order, I took a first crack at it, and then sent it to a really smart friend, who like, reordered the whole thing and lovingly <laughs> explained why my original order was totally wrongheaded and she was absolutely right and so that was yeah, she did it. a great job <laughs> yeah, she, yeah she did a great job I can take I can take no credit um, I did not yeah I did not order it and I did not title it uh but um but I I'm I I, I got good counsel <laughs> that's so funny the the friend of, I have also a friend who does that same thing for me weirdly enough and she um she's actually the person who gave me the idea for that that I that I love which she describes the collection as a diving bell and um and that sort of the, the shape where you're yeah you're you're like yeah. you start up here and they sort of you take you go down deeper 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 and then you get to like come back up um for the second yeah. half and I that's love that so funny. much that I like basically just stole that from her and every time I have a collection now I'm like here make it a diving bell you do your thing yeah oh that's amazing yeah I love that no the dive the diving bell is so good that's a useful image yeah it's such a nice way to like immerse yourself like you were saying so I had maybe one more question that I wanted to ask you before um we maybe open it up to audience questions if that sounds good I think a lot of your work is very funny. Um, some of your stories can be really funny and, and it's like have this like wonderful sense of invention and play to them. And I, I wonder like what are your thoughts on the relationship between rage and humor? Like I, I think of them and again thinking about the way that rage is kind of a more textured um, emotional state than than anger or, or annoyance. Um, and I, I do sort of feel like rage and humor are natural companions. I, I'm not sure why, uh, but I, yeah, I was hoping that you might have some insight. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and you know, by the way, I also think that your stories are very funny. So I love the <laughs> elegant humor. Um, 
It's uh, so, so yeah, I think they're natural companions. I mean, oh my God, I can't even imagine like, you know, writing an entire collection that's just like angry if it, if it wasn't also, if there wasn't humor in there, it would just be like horrible to read, right? <laughs> I mean, I would, you would just want to kill yourself um, reading it. So, uh, you know, like there's, and actually it's funny because the story I read is like not funny at all, but, but, um, but, you know, you read a piece like that and then you need something <laughs> afterwards. That's, that's a sort of a palate cleanser. I think, you know, I think that's, it's just human, it's human nature, right? Like you can't, you know, sort of get through a, a traumatizing experience or an experience like that produces some sort of extreme emotion without like, kind of laughing about it. I mean, in some ways, this, a, a heightened state of extreme emotion is just ridiculous. Um, it, it, you know, anytime you have a, a human in a state of like heightened emotion, it's just, it, there's something about that that's just like laughable. Um, you know, it's, there's something also that's very tragic about it. So it's like the, the two coins, yeah. two sides of the same coin, but but there's always something that's that's very sort of funny about it. And um, and it can be funny in an endearing way or funny in a, you know, God, this is awful kind of way. But um, yeah, if you, and I also feel like it's it's weird too because how humor works in, in fiction. I don't know if you have this experience, but like I'll write pieces and I don't really know that they're funny. And then I, people will be like, oh, I thought that story was really funny. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> or, or vice versa, right? I'll try to be funny. And then it's like, yeah, yes. that was a really sad, like downer of a piece. And I'm like, oh. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> I have, I'm often surprised by, by what readers find funny. And then yes, I've had that experience where it's like, I think I put like a great joke in a story and I read it. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> right. <laughs> um, you know, I was thinking too about like the great, some of the great stand up comics and how rage is so often integral to the humor, right? Um, and it's what gives, gives the humor so, like, like urgency and, and weight that it's not just, it's not just ha ha funny. It has, it has deeper fuel and in the way that rage and humor can work together to like escalate intensity, which I think you certainly see in, in stand-up comedy. I mean, that's what I, I think we like really angry stand-up. I mean, there's, it's like, they're the most electric people on stage. Yeah. Um, partly because I think there's, there's the, 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 the anger, the rage, it, it, it leaves you feeling like you're on this kind of high wire, right? And where, where is this person going to step next? Where are we going to go? Where are we going to go next? What, what lines might we cross or at least challenge in some mm -hmm. ways? And I think rage can have a similar quality in fiction um, yeah. that it that it that it it gets it it creates that that very intense, very urgent sort of kinetic um, high wire experience for the reader. And also, it can lead us. It can lead us in some cases to a place of catharsis too. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it gives us it gives us like an like a physical outlet. Yep. Yep. And it's also just like, it's uncomfortable, right? Like rage is very uncomfortable and you watch someone that is, that is like that electric and that heightened. And it's almost, it's almost so uncomfortable to watch that you have to laugh, that you have mm -hmm. to like have some sort of release in here. Yeah. Because... Right. Yeah. It's like a, it's like a physical, um, uh, yeah. Like a, like a physical release. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, maybe Abby, this would be a good time to turn it over to questions if if there if there are questions. Great. Yes, we have lots of questions. So right. thank okay. you so much, Lauren. Cool. Okay. Um, let's start with this one. It's for both of you from Wendy. Um, do you, and if so, how do you share your rage with your friends? Uh, do they know of your rage? Do you feel safe letting <laughs> others know of your rage or do you hide it? Um uh yes they know of my rage <laughs> <laughs> i do not hide it <laughs> oh, well um or at all uh definitely um yeah i think i, I think it's it's a lot of you know there's a, a lot of text messaging back and forth these days um <laughs> about um things that are that are terrible or anger um uh yeah, I don't know. I, I, I'm not. I'm not good at hiding it, despite being Midwestern. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I would. I would. Yes, the people in my life know know of my rage, um, 100%. Uh, and I also box, which. Yeah. Yeah. 
which is a which is kind of a, like, a, pla- a place to a place to put it also <laughs> yeah get some of the physical energy out <laughs> yeah, yeah. Great. Um, this question is from Alyssa. Um, how do you, how does an analysis of whiteness intersect with your narratives around female rage and does that impact your writing? That's a good question. Yeah. Um, well, I think that this goes back to what, um, what I was talking about. And it was something that I was thinking about a lot in the 2016 election and, and as a white woman, Who's, who, who's writing stories from the point of view of white women is is again how 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 are the systems that they're moving through how have they harmed them um, and also of equal importance how are they how are how are they culpable in harm um, how are they um, participating in systems that are destructive um, both to themselves and others how are they upholding those systems and I think that that's you know really what I meant earlier when I was talking about um, thinking about the stories in a systemic context, in addition to um, like an individual context, you know, not only thinking about you know these characters as individual human beings and the other characters in the stories as individual human beings, but also like like how are what the po- the power dynamics between the characters, and also um, in relation to the larger world. And I think you know you can't really are I feel like you can't really think in that systemic context without, for me at least, it, it, it absolutely meant thinking about um, whiteness uh, and, and, and writing, writing about whiteness as, as subject to a certain degree. I think that's right, yeah. And it's, and it's very, um, it, it's, it's also good to point out, I guess, that like, you know, and I hope to do that in stories, that rage isn't always, isn't always good or isn't always earned and and much like you know sort of the ubiquitous white women's tears that you know rage is often sort of a, a go-to in some ways for you know like oh i feel wronged or um and and in a way often that perpetuates violence on others in in that systemic way right so like you know karen pissed off at the supermarket <laughs> you know um calls the manager and uh, on you know the the woman that's, that's working at the store um, and you know, there, that's that's like this whole there's there's this whole sort of idea that like if you're a woman, rage is is maybe always earned or is always good in some way. And you know, there's like complicated stuff with the women's march and all kinds of things that sort of you know came out around around that idea. But um, yeah, I think it's definitely good to push back on 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 that as well and sort of this idea of an, an entitlement or uh, who gets to be angry. I mean, obviously, there's a whole conversation about you know, what happens when white women are angry versus, you know, um, when women of color get angry and how society perceives that, um, you know. And um, so, yeah, I think that's definitely like a really important conversation to have. Great, thank you. Um, this question is from Steph. Uh, how does the short story especially approach rage in that the abbreviation doesn't force, force catharsis? Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. That's a good one. Ooh. Well, I think this short story is kind of a great place for extremity in a, in a, in a more general way. And if we think of rage as being an extreme um, state of state of being and that you don't um, you don't necessarily have the, the burden of sustainability, which is to say to keep a narrative sort of propulsive and urgent for for a prolonged um period of time and and in that way I, I mean I think that um there's something about the sort of natural intensifying like compactness of the story that can be a really yeah a, 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 an interesting space for um for for rage for anguish for things that are on sort of the more extreme end of the emotional spectrum yeah I think that's right it's it, like I mean the story that I read is like not a story that you would want to read 20 pages of that would just be terrible <laughs> it would you know um but but it's something that you can it's like a grass fire it can burn you know really quickly um and and in some ways it's not uh not necessarily catharsis but it's something else it's almost um uh it almost goes back to that idea of transformation you're not necess- you're you're sort of burning it all down to 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 turn it into something completely different um 
um, as opposed to sort of the, it's like alchemical, I guess, <laughs> as opposed to catharsis. Great, let's see. Um, this is a question for Laura. Can you tell us about the inspiration for the topic of impersonating a dead uh, spouse? Uh, um, <laughs> you know, it was an idea that I had for a, a long time. Um, Th this was a this was like a, a a great sort of lesson I think in in terms of like how books can how reading other writers is sometimes can give us these really important keys in our own work. Um, I I had had the idea for a long time. I don't know exactly where it came from. I mean, there are there are um, you know I mean it's it's not like an unlikely job in our in our contemporary moment. I mean there there are jobs where you you know you're like like you fill in seats at a funeral or you, um, yeah, or, or you impersonate or not impersonate, but sort of pretend to be, you know, a, a particular, play a particular role in sort of a social context. I mean, there, it's, it's a, it's a thing, it's a thing that exists. And in, and in this story has just taken a real thing and sort of magnified it. Um, so it, it starts to feel a little bit speculative or, or a little bit not quite of this, um, of this world. Uh, and I tried to write the story in a very, in just like a, like a very conventional linear way. And I got sort of so tangled up in the logistics and the world building that I would, I would write like five pages and just feel utterly defeated. Um, and then I happened to be reading Dennis Johnson's posthumous collection, The Largest with Sea Maiden. I was thinking a lot about the title story, which I really love, and also um, Yen Lee's amazing collection, um, uh, Bold Boy, Emerald Girl. And I, I, I love her work so much. And she does amazing kind of like quietly radical things with time and fracturing time and disrupting um, linearity and and both of those stories are both of those books kind of reminded me that like you don't have to write this in a linear way um you can you can disrupt time and you can fracture time and so that led to the the, the non-linear structure with these um different short titled sections and it's like that is not a unique uh insight uh, by any means um i i've been aware that you didn't have to tell a story in a linear way for like some time before that, but I, it's just reading those two writers kind of reminded me of that when I really needed to be reminded of that. So yeah, it was, a, it was an idea that I'd had for a long time. It just, but it also took a long time for the story to find its right shape and structure. Great, thank you. All right, let's see this um, question is, uh, do you ever find rage paralytic? or writing about rage exhausting or anything? Yeah, I, th I think yes. I mean, I, I, it's like Laura was saying, you know, it's, it, it actually stops action a lot of times, right? It, it, it actually stops the story or stops the character um, and stops the writer sometimes too, right? <laughs> yeah, if you're, if you're too like caught up in it, um, it, it can definitely, I think, paralyze. Um, it's, it's actually funny. Um, you know, probably, I think I think a lot of the stories that I wrote as revenges, uh, these revenges are are pretty short pieces. And mm -hmm. like, if I would have, and and they came out like normally, it takes me anywhere from six months to two years to you know to write a short story. Um, you know, that's three months to two years. But like, um, in this case, I probably wrote all of those in like a day or two. And and you know extensive revision obviously but but like I think it would have some of those the the rage was so heightened in them that it actually would have been really difficult to like to write them as like a sustained piece um over a longer period of time so that in, in some ways that's kind of yeah I, th I think that's right yeah, I mean, I think writing about any kind of tense emotion in fiction, I mean, much like living it um, can be exhausting. And, and I think that also, again, to go back to think about the distinction between anger and rage, I think sometimes anger has a solution, um, right? Like there is not, not certainly not always, but in some cases, anger has a solution. Like there is, there is a problem, I am angry about it, but there is also some prospect of the problem being addressed or solved. And I think with rage, part of the intensity comes from again, being both sort of like personal and systemic in nature. And in that way, 
Um, it's not that they're not solutions, but maybe they're not immediate solutions or there's not an, an immediate kind of fix to the problem and thus the intensity and thus the sort of vastness of, of the emotional um, experience. But I think which can, you know, which of course can be exhausting and demoralizing um, to, to, to live in and to write in. Um, but I think in some ways the emotional states that resist easy resolution that resist like a, a clean kind of compact resolution for me are are the truest conduits to exploring like the 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 gnarliest like dimensions of our world um and so i guess it feels necessary to me even if it is sometimes hard Thank you. I think that's um, all we have time for. So uh, thank you so much to Amber and Laura for joining us today. And for those of you tuning in, we are so grateful for your work and your thoughts. So thank you for sharing, sharing that with us. Thank yes, you. this is really fun. Thank you all so much. Yeah, and the, the gratitude continues. It has to continue for our presenting sponsors, uh, St. Catherine University and Star Tribune. Uh, don't forget to grab yourself a copy of both Amber and Laura's books below. Um, from our friends at Majors and Quinn. You can find more information about the Loft and Wordplay programming at loftwordplay.org. And if you want to pitch in a few dollars to help keep the Loft programming moving forward, we'd be forever grateful. Uh, any dollar amount makes you a Loft member, which comes with a whole bunch of lovely perks beyond the warm and fuzzy feelings you get from supporting your literary community. Um, so thanks again, Amber and Laura, and have a great day, everyone. Yeah, thank you.